Good morning and welcome to class number seven on the Holy Spirit, where today we're going to be surveying John 14, 15, and 16 and seeing some things that Jesus said to the apostles here. And uh, the last question on the material is going to be dealing with how do we know when to apply certain parts of this text only to the apostles and when would we apply it to all Christians today? So we'll work our way towards that question, but I'm fine interjecting that question as we go through this. Uh, but as the, as the rest of these classes shake out, Lord willing, this is the plan. So next week we have uh, Todd Chandler here. I think some of you have heard of him. Um, and then two weeks uh, from today, we're going to survey some things from Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit is, dis uh, regarding the Holy Spirit. And then um, we'll have another class with just kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of other passages that deal with the Holy Spirit. And then some topical questions about whether or not miracles are happening today. And what does it mean that the Spirit dwells in us? Because of Teens in the Green and a gospel meeting, this, these classes would have otherwise been 13 and so that uh, makes it so we can't cover as much material. But I will say this, that if I get enough unique questions from the things we've been talking about, I may do a Q&A kind of sermon where I take in the questions and then address some other things that uh, maybe you felt like we didn't get time to talk about in, in these classes. Uh, so uh, we'll get into John 14 through 16 in just a moment, but let's open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness towards us. We thank you for all the things that, that the Spirit has done uh, to give us new life, to reveal your word to us, uh, to, to help us in these ways. We pray that you'd give us wisdom and discernment and knowledge. We pray that as we study this difficult topic, that we would understand it the way that it has been revealed in Scripture. Thank you for all of us who are here this morning and pray that uh, you'd help all of us put our minds to these passages and understand them in a way that would be pleasing to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, you can be opening your Bibles to John 14. And uh, I want to start out just with the context of this passage. So in John 13, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet and there's been discussions about who's going to betray him. And uh, so if you look at John 14, Jesus is going to begin talking to the apostles about some things that are very troubling to them. Uh, look at John 14, starting in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. By the way, that's a good verse to help you know how to not have your heart be troubled. Uh, is The more we believe in God, the less that will be the case. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms... If it were not so, I would, would I not have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and, that, and you know the way to where I am going. Okay. Uh, let, just start out with these two questions here, because if we understand what he's doing in the first four verses here, I think we'll have a good understanding of, of how to frame these chapters but what is Jesus concerned with for the apostles? Yeah, don't, don't be worried. Don't, don't become anxious. About what? Yeah, yeah, he's about to be leaving. Have you ever had a good friend that was going to move away or you weren't going to see as much anymore? Uh, and your heart would start to get troubled? Have you ever left people and had to move somewhere else and you had to leave people behind that really meant a lot to you and that troubles your heart? Jesus is telling the apostles that I'm going to be going somewhere and doing some things, preparing a place for you. There's debates about what all of that means. Is that really talking about the afterlife as we think about it? Or is it talking about their role as apostles? Or is it talking about the church being a foundation and a building that Jesus is preparing all these things to make it so that they start happening? That's not really the purview of what we're talking about right now, though. But imagine being an apostle, and this guy that you've spent three, three and a half years with is about to leave. What struggles might you have if you were hearing him say that? Yeah, like, I thought we were just getting things started, and now you're saying that you're leaving? That doesn't make sense to me. What else? Yeah. 
Right, but then even after that, he's going to ascend back. There's so many things that they need to process that they, they're not ready to even yet. Yeah. Um, anything else you guys want to say just about the initial thing that starts this section off? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yep, good. Good. All right, yeah. Yes. Yeah, this, yeah. We thought he was going to destroy the Roman Empire. Of course, is he bringing the spiritual kingdom? It, yes, uh, and which is one of the reasons why you need the miraculous abilities to prove that this invisible kingdom is there. Patty? Yes. Yes, very good. So then you see, this is what we're going to do then in this class, is what are the other concerns of the apostles as we go through these chapters? And then how does Jesus' teachings on the Holy Spirit give them comfort? What is the Spirit going to do for them and through them and with them that would give them comfort in this context of Jesus having to leave? And then thirdly, what is the fulfillment of these promises that Jesus made? So that's going to be uh, what we look at. Now, the first thing I want to do is think about what is it that the apostles are concerned with? How do they articulate their own concerns throughout these chapters? And so um, look at these passages. We'll look at them one by one, but I'm just going to put them all up here. If you have a red letter Bible, we're looking at all the times that there are not red letters in John 14 through 16. So we're going we're gonna to take one slice through these chapters and see what they're worried about. And then we're going to take another slice through these chapters and see what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay, so look first of all at some of these non-red letters and ask yourself, what is it that the apostles are concerned with in these various passages? Look at John chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are, you are going. How can we know the way? All right, what is Thomas concerned with here? Yeah, the physical, where are you going? There's a lot of things that we don't understand. Anything else you guys want to say about that one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if, if, the, if the shepherd's gone, then what's going to happen to the sheep here? So he's leaving, and then that's Thomas's question. Good. Anything else on that one? All right, look down at chapter 14, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. What's the concern there? Yeah, this has been one of the main points of the whole Gospel of John, that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Jesus is going to say that in this context here. Uh, but they're not, Jesus is leaving. What about the Father? Can you at least show us something about the Father? They're still not understanding things. They're trying to process that Jesus is about to leave. Go over to chapter 16. And look at verses 17 and 18. Some of the disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Try to get into the mind of the apostles here. What, what are they concerned about here? Yeah, they, we, we need some more information. And, and by the way, when Jesus says, a little while you won't see me, a little while you will see me, um, would that apply specifically to the apostles there? Like he's going to come back after his resurrection? Like we see that there's some things that are clearly only applying to the apostles here, and we see that going on right there. But go over to chapter 16, verses 29 and 30. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly, and not using figurative speech, now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. 
All right, uh, and Jesus is still going to be challenging them a little bit there. But they kind of seem like they're understanding a little bit more than they did before. But I just wanted to highlight these non-red letter sections here first to show the apostles are going through a lot of anguish. There's things that they're trying to process. There's things that they're not understanding. And threaded throughout all of these chapters, Jesus will say something about the coming of the Spirit. And the coming of the Spirit is going to do something to comfort them in the work that they're about to be doing. All right, so you guys understand the mindset of the apostles to, to some extent at least. Any comments or questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes, yeah, so if you're, if you're leaving, what, what are we going to have that's going to allow us to keep trusting in you or empower us to do this work that you've asked us to do and, th- and then enter the Spirit? Yeah, Matt? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So with G- how cryptic Jesus has been, and oh, now you're talking to us plainly, like, but we still don't understand everything we'd like to understand. Um, r- four times throughout these chapters, he'll say something about the Spirit, and it's going to take, it's going to lead you guys, and you're going to be okay, and all that kind of thing. But then part of the challenge with looking at this is, to what extent do these passages apply to all Christians today? Now, we're, we'll talk about that as we go through this. But look at the first passage where Jesus starts saying things about the Holy Spirit. So go back to chapter 14. And look at John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. All right. Uh, What is it that Jesus is promising about the spirit here? And by the way, anybody notice any different words that are used in this passage? Uh, What word does he use to describe the spirit? Spirit of truth. What else? The helper, um, that word for helper uh, means like advocate, counselor, um, something that's going to come alongside and help you do the work that you've been called to do. He's called also the spirit of truth in verse 17, which means that there's something about revealing truth that the spirit is going to do for them. Uh, What other observations do you guys have about what the spirit or the helper is going to do here? What was that? Yeah, it'll be with he'll be with you forever. What else? Yeah, so if he if he's going away, but the spirit has come and the spirit's gonna continue telling you the truth that you need to know, um, you're not gonna be at a loss, but it's gonna be a difference in how things have been happening up to this point. Good. Anything else so far? Yeah. Uh, and the yes. Yeah. Emphasizes the intimacy of relationship here that they're going to have. In fact, in verse seventeen, the Spirit will dwell in you. If you go back up to verse eleven of this same chapter, it says, "Believe." me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. What does it mean that Jesus is in the Father and the Father's in Jesus? Same unified in purpose and uh, this intimacy of, of relationship. We're going to have a class on what does it mean for the Spirit to dwell in you but in this context what would the Spirit dwelling in them mean? Same unified purpose, mission, uh, intimacy of relationship, things like that. Jim? Yes. Yes. So you can. Yes. Did you have something else? Yeah. 
Yes, very good. Yeah, so if there's this, if Jesus the shepherd is leaving, the spirit of truth is going to help you. It's going to be there for you and with you. Were you going to say something, Matt? Yes, yeah, uh, the people in the world are not going to receive. So what is that? If the apostles are being guided by this uh, spirit that's going to tell them this truth, things like that, um, and the world won't receive these things, what does that anticipate will happen to the apostles who are sharing the words of the spirit? They won't receive them. And in chapter 16, Jesus is going to talk about how these guys are going to be persecuted and kicked out of the synagogues and people will think that they're doing God a service. Notice, by the way, in this passage, the Spirit is referring to as uh, him and he. Like, this is not some kind of impersonal force like in Star Wars. This is a person that is, that's, is being addressed or talked about here. Um, I, I was on the phone a couple days ago with somebody whose wife died a few years ago. And... Um, I had called his, his house number first, and every time I call that number accidentally, which I now deleted, it, every time he doesn't answer, it goes immediately to voicemail. So then I called him on his cell phone, and he said, yeah, uh, whenever, whenever uh, uh, people call my home number, I, I, it always says that the, voice box, the voicemail is full because when my wife died, I've kept all the messages of all the people that were calling to comfort me after she died. And so sometimes he'll go back and listen to the spirit of those people talking and it brings him back and gives him comfort whenever he's worried about that. And you almost wonder, is, is that to an extent, but not a, a great illustration to an extent, in the ballpark of what Jesus is saying? I'm going, but my spirit will come and you'll have the words of truth that will still guide you. Anthony? Right. Yes. It's exact. Yep, good, good. All right, let's look at the next passage. And as we put these together, and I, I know that we're kind of jumping around. We're isolating certain things in these passages. Uh, but if we understand what's going on with the apostles, I think we can just isolate these passages and, and get some things from this for our purposes. Look at John 14, verses 25 to 27. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Okay, uh, what does he say that the Spirit will do for the apostles here? Yes. Yes, so what does that mean? Yes. I mean, how, uh, so imagine spending three and a half years with Jesus, and you've heard him preach the Sermon on the Mount, and he preached the Sermon on the Plain, and he uses some of the same illustrations, but different contexts, so he kind of drives different points, and, and you're trying to track all of this, and you're like, I, you know, I can't remember everything that he's ever said, but the Spirit is going to bring to remembrance. Well, how is it going to do that? I don't know. I don't know the mechanism of that. Uh, does, does that mean like things will just pop into their mind or something? I don't know. But this is something that, that Jesus is going to, he's promising to the apostles who have spent time with Jesus. You've heard me teach and I will bring to remembrance the things you've heard me talk about. Um, uh, this, by the way, this is also why in verse 27 they can have peace. He talks about my peace I give to you, this peace that you're going to have, is going to come from the Spirit bringing to remembrance all of these things that I talked about. Don't feel like you've got to have a giant backpack filled with all notes from all the things that you've ever heard me say. You're going to have a lot on your plate, and the Spirit's going to help bring to remembrance all of these things. Um, another observation, uh, this is 
you could argue why we can have confidence in the New Testament, in the Bible that we have, is because the apostles were told they would have these things brought to remembrance. One of the ways that that would happen is in the act of writing these things down. We're going to say more about that in just a moment, but do you guys have any other thoughts or comments on these first passages? Yes. Yes. Yeah, bring to, like, all the things that they need to know. Yes. Which is why in 2 Peter chapter 1, he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. We have everything that we need. Lily? Yes. Yeah, this word is not a common word. Um, and it's, I, I think it gives us another avenue to understanding some of the work of the Spirit. At least, at least on behalf of the apostles. Uh, you can imagine all the the persecution they're going to face, all the difficulties they're going to go through, and this advocate, this counselor is going to be with them. Uh, 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 how do you say it? Right, by, right beside them just to give them the comfort and the, the words that they need. Um, good. All right, anything else you guys want to say about that? Yeah. Right, so then we, yeah, Noah? Yes, the world has one way of talking about peace, but then God has his way of talking about it. And if you want worldly peace, what God says is going to seem like not peace to you, and vice versa. Um, can you start to understand a little bit uh, what, what ways we would interact with these promises? Are, are these, so when, when, when God says to Noah, I want you to build an ark. Do you know that the Bible tells all of you to build an ark? Because the Bible says build an ark. The Bible says it, right? Doesn't it say to build an ark? It does say it. And it doesn't really matter who he's talking to because the Bible just says it, right? It matters who he's talking to. And so if Jesus is saying this to the apostles, what did the apostles do that would ever give us the kind of peace in some way that Jesus is talking about here. Now, we're going to continue working our way towards that. We haven't even gotten to the most controversial of these passages. Uh, look at John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he'll bear witness about me... And you also will bear witness because you have been with him, me for the, uh, from the beginning. Okay, we learn a um, couple, at least one other thing here that we haven't seen yet up to this point. Uh, the Spirit is going to bear witness about Jesus. What is it that the Spirit wants to make much of? Jesus, yes. By the way, I think a ver verses like this, that the Spirit bears witness about Jesus... The modern charismatic movements that make a big deal about the spirit and the spirit this and the spirit that and I felt the spirit and all this. Um, what, you, what is it that the spirit's seeking to do? Make much of himself or much of Jesus? Make much of Jesus. He's bearing witness. To, now, it doesn't mean the Bible still talks about the Spirit, and there's things that the Bible gives credit to the Spirit for, things like that. But Jesus is saying that the Spirit's role is to point people to Jesus. Um, and so that's maybe one other observation we can pick up as we go through this. Anything else you guys want to say just about this one before we get to the, the more controversial passage here? Okay, let's just get to it. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. 7 through 15, yeah. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. 
For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father uh, has is mine, therefore I said, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All right. What is the basic thing that the Spirit's going to do uh, in this passage? There's going to be a transference of information, and that information's going to do what? Convict. Uh, and so in verses 7 through 11, convict through words. Uh, it's going to convict the world of sin. People are guilty of sin. It's going to convict people about righteousness, how to live righteously. It's going to convict people about judgment. Our judgments are wrong. God's judgment is good. There's a final judgment day. There's a lot of things that you could say maybe are related to these three things Jesus brings up here. But when the Spirit comes, the apostles then will declare these words to the world. And this is what the words from the Spirit through the apostles are going to do uh, in the world that will oftentimes reject it. Thoughts or comments through verse 11 on this? Okay. Uh, What about in verses 12 through 15? The Spirit is going to offer guidance... And glorify Jesus. How many of you have heard somebody take verse 13? When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. How many of you have heard somebody take that verse and said, yeah, the spirit's guiding me into all truth. And that's why I had that dream that I had last night. Or that's why I had that nudge on my heart. Or that's why I I felt like a voice told me to go take my Bible to that coffee shop and ask that person for a Bible study. Have you guys ever heard people talk that kind of way? What is Jesus talking about here? Revealing the word through the apostles. Yeah, this is why, if somebody says, well, are are you saying that this isn't a promise for us? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. or a command for us, or whatever. Like, well, what about Noah building the ark? What about the offerers in the book of Leviticus having to offer sacrifices? We have to remember to whom is being addressed. Yeah, Wes? Yes. Yeah, good, good. Anything else on this? Yeah, oh, Amy? Yeah, uh, if this was a promise for all Christians, why would we all have debates about things? Do you think everybody in this room sees everything exactly the same way? So why hasn't the Spirit, like, guided us in some supernatural, individualistic kind of way for us to do those kinds of things. Um, remember one of the previous classes we talked about, the empowering of the Holy Spirit? There's people throughout the Old Testament that the Spirit would rush on uh, and give them special abilities for a specific purpose at a specific time. Uh, and I would look at the apostles as being like that. And so I, I'd argue, and we'll say more about this in a second, that their written words accomplished this kind of guiding. They were guided individually, Can we be guided into all truth as well? In so long as we take what the apostles wrote and take them into our hearts and do the things that it tells us to do. Can we be guided into all truth? But when Jesus says this, is he telling to the apostles, all right, guys, you're going to be guided into all truth with regards to what college you should go to. And I'm going to also guide you into all truth on who you should marry. And if you want to buy that camel versus that camel, because that one has NOS, but that one's got a really nice leather seat on it, uh, whatever, like I'm going to give you nudges to help you know which camel to buy. When you go to the grocery store, there might be a poisoned avocado, and I'm going to give you a sense to know which avocado is the poisoned one so you avoid that one. Like, doesn't, it, doesn't what Jesus, what he's talking about here seems much grander and broader then the ways people have used passages like this, you guys are going to have Jesus leave you. 
You're going to have the mission of transforming the whole world. How do we get the message out there? What's going to empower us to do this? The spirit, the comforter, the helper is going to be with you for these grand purposes. Yes. Yes. And, and, and this, these are not the kind of concerns Jesus has for the apostles in this context at all. And so you're just ripping something. First of all, Jesus is talking to the apostles. Secondly, what he's talking to the apostles about are not the kinds of things people today say the Spirit's giving me feelings or dreams or nudges about. We have to be really careful about anything that we think makes us super duper extra special. God loves everybody. Everybody who's in Christ is equally loved. And, but people that want to take upon themselves things that make them really unique and really special... And they have to do that by taking verses like this out of context. You, we got to be really careful about that kind of thing. Um, now, we'll say more about how the apostles accomplished this through the writing of, their, of the scriptures. But do you guys have any other thoughts or comments before we leave that? Yeah. Right. Yep, and we're going to have a class where we talk more about that. Yeah, Adam? Yes. Yep. Yes, and, and when the apostles, do you see anything in the book of Acts about the apostles? Well, you know, Paul was going to do this or something, and then he just had this really strange feeling, and he didn't know how to interpret it, and maybe it meant he should go this way. Do you ever see anything like that in the Bible? The, yes, the Macedonian call in Acts 16, where uh, Paul has this vision and there's this guy saying, come to Europe and help us. Please come and help us. Paul didn't go, hmm, I'm not sure what that meant. But I think God's leading me in this direction. No, it's not like that. Laura and then Jim. I think... The Spirit and, and Jesus share these things, and these things are going to be given to them by means of the Spirit. I think it's emphasizing the intimacy that this Father, or that Jesus and the Spirit have with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But sometimes we want self-will to be baptized with Holy Spirit language, and then be like, well, can you just be honest for a second? Is this what you want? It was like, do you really need, to, you know, but sometimes we play games with ourselves with that. Over, Renfro, and then over here after that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there's no question about it, you know. Uh, yeah. Rob? <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Exactly. Yep. And you can understand, they didn't have the written word down yet. They were the ones that were going to do all that. So it sure would be helpful for the Spirit to guide them in that way. Yeah. Lily? Okay, so, yeah, so when people say that I think the Holy Spirit's talked to me or communicated to me this or that, um, one thing that, if imagine that you grow up in a family that talks this way and believes this way. And then, do, don't we all have, like, feelings and thoughts and, and stuff? Like, what, what if I've been conditioned to believe that all of these things come from God? Like, can you, can you see how somebody could be habituated into thinking this way. Now, I, I don't know that it's my role to, to convince everybody that all their experiences are not from God or the Holy Spirit, but my, my purpose would be, show me where the Bible says that these things happen in the way that you're talking about. Because if we believe that the scripture is the authority, um, you, have, you should be able to go back and show me in the Bible where the Spirit's doing this. And if that causes the person to go, well, maybe, maybe it was something else or whatever. But my, my first thing is, what does the Bible say about this? And do we have a fundamental disagreement on what the Bible says? And if we do, I want to talk about those things. So, but let me, let, let's show how <clears throat> the New Testament very clearly picks up these promises and applies them to the apostles. I'm, I'm going to machine gun through some passages that show that. Even in the Gospel of John, it does it. John 20, verses 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written... These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If the promise to be guided by the Spirit, and the Spirit would guide everybody into all truth, apart from whatever the apostles were doing here, was this some thing that was given to every Christian? Why would this need to be written so that you can believe? Wouldn't the Spirit of truth given you feelings and nudges and dreams to help you know things? Why does this need to be written down? Well, John is an apostle who was promised he would be guided by the truth and the Spirit would convict the world. Does the Gospel of John convict people when you read it? Yeah. Look at this other passage. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. What does the Apostle Paul say he's doing from the Spirit? He's given him words, and we speak these words, and spiritual people are going to discern what these things mean. So it applies to the Apostle John. It applies to the Apostle Paul. Let me give you another passage that the Apostle Paul says, in, but does anybody have any thoughts or comments before we... Okay, look at this one in Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets... Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. All right, Jesus is the cornerstone, but who's the foundation of this new building that is being made spiritually? Okay, what did the apostles and prophets do? And by the way, I think prophets there is talking about New Testament prophets, which are non-apostles who wrote books of the Bible down. Who are non-apostles in the New Testament that wrote books of the Bible? Luke, Jude, uh, the, the Gospel of Mark, although I think Mark was influenced by the Apostle Peter, uh, but Mark himself wasn't an apostle. So if these guys are laying the foundation, don't you see how that has a point of, of correlation with what Jesus is promising the apostles in, in John? You guys are going to be get guided into all truth. You guys will convict the world through these things that you're writing down. Uh, Ephesians 3, verses 4 and 5 makes it even more clear. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. 
So here, Paul, writing to the Ephesians, is talking about how he's this minister of the gospel, and the gospel's putting Jew and Gentile together. And, and it, when you read the things that I say about this, you can perceive my insight into this mystery, and who's making this mystery known to Paul? The Spirit. And who's the Spirit making these things known to? Directly, first. The apostles and prophets. Now, how many of us want to say that we're on the same level as an apostle or prophet? How many of us want to take John 16, 13 and go, oh yeah, that's a promise directly for me today? When you see passages like this, that the apostles were going to be guided in these special kinds of ways, and even when the apostles were guided, we're not told exactly how all of that worked. Um, so to presume that they were just having nudges and feelings and all this kind of stuff. That comes more historically from pagan ideas and how pagan people thought that their gods were leading them than anything that the Bible says. Anthony? Yes. Now, could we say then, if somebody was to ask you, hey, is the Spirit guiding you into truth? How many of you, raise your hand if you'd be comfortable saying yeah. For sure. How? Through his word that the apostles have written down, things like that. But I don't want to put myself on the same field as the apostles and prophets. They're the foundation. They're the ones that had things specially revealed to them. And so for me to look at whatever God did with the apostles and go, oh, well, he did it in the Bible, and, and assume that that has to apply to me today, when we've got other passages like what he's saying here, when you read this, you can understand. So if you want to know what the truth is, you've got to read, you've got to study, you've got to learn things, you've got to discuss it with people and think through these things together. Any other thoughts or comments on that? Yeah. In 2 Corinthians, next quarter we're going to be talking about 2 Corinthians, so we'll tie it back then, Lord willing, if I remember. Uh, this last question here. If, if many of the promises were specifically for the apostles in, second, in uh, John 14 through 16, how do we discern which parts of this text apply to Christians today? Have you ever heard people ask this question? That there are certain parts in John 14 through 16 like Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, was, did he only say that to the apostles? Is that only true for the apostles? Yes, yes. Yeah. And so when Jesus is saying some like overarching principle that is shown to apply to Christians in other passages, things like that. But like in John 16, 22, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. I think that's talking about when he rises from the dead. Um, that applies to the apostles there, but it's helping us understand their experience. How many of you have had a, a conversation with somebody where parts of the conversation apply only to that person, but other parts of the conversation could apply to lots of people? You ever had a conversation like that? So you have to look at what parts Jesus is talking about here that can be corroborated with other passages that apply it to all Christians. But when he's talking about the Spirit, and then you compare what the Spirit's doing through the apostles in these other passages, that's clearly only talking about the apostles. So you have to do some work to figure out, well, which is applying to the apostles, which to all Christians. But um, 
hopefully maybe that offers some guidance for that. Okay, uh, so Lord willing, next week, uh, Todd Chandler's going to be here. Two weeks from now, we'll survey some things in Romans chapter 8. And I appreciate the good discussion and willingness to study through these things together.